There we go. Okay, here they are. My beloved guinea pigs, Allegra and Claritin. Now, uh, about a year ago, I started a Pinterest board called Guinea Pig Fairy Village. Uh, my, my vision is that instead of a, instead of a cage, I was going to build them something like, uh, I know, somewhere between like a Hobbit village and the Keebler Elf tree. And, you know, since, since guinea pigs are social animals, instead of just the two of them, I'd have like a, I'd have like a whole colony going on. But uh, now, uh, I hit some roadblocks almost immediately. Um, now, as their name suggests, I'm kind of allergic to them, and I'm not particularly good at cleaning up after them either. So it's like two of them I can live with, but a whole village would be maybe, maybe too much to handle. And uh, the other problem is that, you know, I'm not a particularly handy person, and I, I don't think they sell uh, Keebler Elf trees at, uh, at Ikea. Um, so, so at first I think, okay, well, I'm a problem solver. Maybe I can just release a bunch of dung beetles in the village and, you know, let nature take its course. But then I think, no, wait, 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 I'm a programmer. I don't build stuff. I, I, I code. I can, I can code a virtual guinea pig village. They can live in cyberspace. Now, I'm here today to talk about my process for designing this. Uh, I'm going to focus on the ideas of messages and processes. Uh, that's big. Uh, it, <laughs> And messages and processes, how these patterns appear in seemingly unrelated contexts. You know, it's bleeding edge browser apps and like that Redu React Redux salad. Uh, giant distributed systems, even, even boring old object-oriented programming. And I'm going, I'm going to throw it out out there in, uh, in a very small amount of time. And uh, there's a pretty good chance I don't know what I'm talking about. But uh, I'm going to try and cite my sources along the way. Okay, so I'm going to call this uh, Critterville. Uh, hopefully, I'll have a better name figured out before Zynga sends me a cease and desist. Uh, now, now, in this game or software toy, what have you, uh, you're going to build a village for uh, build this village for guinea pigs, where there's fixtures like food dishes and toys and houses. Your goal is to attract critters to your village and, and keep them fed and healthy and happy. Yeah, and unlike a lot of these games, like Neko at Sumi or Farmville, it's like this is going to be interactive. You don't just set stuff out and wait. You actually get you actually get to interact with the critters and, and even pet them. I mean, if they're they're if they're down for that. Um, now the, the critters themselves have relatively simple behaviors and, and feedback loops. So you know when they cross the hunger threshold, they go go to the food dish, and uh, also they poop constantly, uh, which uh, <laughs> which the user needs to clean up. Uh, and, and, the, and happy and well-fed critters are going to be friendly to you and to each other, and the, the agitated and hungry ones will get aggressive and eventually leave the village. Um, so now, I, now that I've, I've got my ideas out there, I think I'm ready to start actually like specking this out. So where, where do I start? What kind of, uh, what, what kind of artifact do I want to use as my reference? Uh, so there, there's a couple of different design approaches you see. Um, now, I've worked in the agency world a lot, and uh, the, the way that seems to work a lot is uh, I, I'll, I'll be given a mock-up in order to look, kind of work down the stack. Uh, you know, the designers will come up with this, this mock-up, and I'm supposed to figure out how it works based on what it looks like. Now, that, that, that's, got its, that's got some problems, but you know, I'm suspicious of the opposite approach as well. Like, you know, some, when engineers do this, they'll, they'll, they'll start by you know, cataloging the requirement. They'll... Uh, <laughs> The uh, the category, catalog the requirements in terms of like database schemas and we'll make like these ERD uh, diagrams and, and then we try and build up the stack from there, and uh, uh, both of these approaches they, they they the problem is they leave the the implicit the most important part like which is what it does so I, I want to think like what are the commands that I'm going to issue what are the questions I can ask like what are the messages between me and the computer going to be. So my design artifact is, uh, is the vocabulary of these messages. I mean, these, these aren't technical terms. They have nothing to do with implementation details. These are all about the domain of the product. I mean, this is, this is similar to the uh, ubiquitous language from uh, Eric Evans' uh, domain-driven design, if you're familiar with that. Uh, but, but now let's back up a second. So what do I mean by message? Now, now think of a web server. This is uh, actually the, the very first router from like 1968. Um, you know, in a web server, you interact with it by sending HTTP requests and receiving HTTP messages. Uh, so the, the request message has a type, uh, a path, uh, a protocol, and then a bunch of headers for metadata. Uh, and then the response message has, you know, the protocol, the status code, more headers, and then, you know, down the bottom, the actual page you requested. Uh, the, the client and the server do not have access to each other's state. Uh, any information shared between them has to be explicitly sent from one to the other. This, uh, this air gap here, 
This, is what, this ensures that the client does not need to and cannot care about the server's innards. All that matters is they both speak HTTP. Now, now, now in JavaScript, when we encounter this sort of in message passing, it tends to be in terms of events and event handlers. Uh, so we, we run a callback whenever we uh, a received message matches a particular pattern. So here's, like, here's a HTTP handler for an express server. We've got uh, the app. The app is being told to listen for uh, requests that are, have the post method, um, the user's ID path, and then on the callback, it updates the user. Um, and and that's, that's the same pattern we see with uh, like jQuery uh, DOM handlers, um, and also signals and streams in uh, command line tools in Node. Uh, and each of these domains, uh, the DOM, HTTP, and Unix, they, they all have their own like vocabulary of messages designed around their specific use cases. So now let's start building our vocabulary. Uh, now the, f the first section here, this is, this, these, are, these are the entity types. These are the nouns that we're gonna be using in Fritter Villa. So it's important to establish these explicitly so that we, we have co uh, consistent terminology. I mean, I, I, can't, I can't count the number of times when just because we hadn't written anything down, the designers and the business people and the programmers were all using different terms to refer to the same thing. Now, the rest of these, these are the, the, the user events and the critter events and the date events, these are, these are, these are the things that are going to be ha the, 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 the users and the critters or whatever might instigate. And then the, the opposite side of this is, uh, the, these are the queries that we want to make about our data. I mean, some, some of these are, are, have obvious dependencies on others. Uh, and that, that's okay, because this is not, these are not database fields. These are more like, I mean, these are basically like object-oriented methods. Um, you know, they're, they're, this, they're, this doesn't have to, have to have anything to do with how the data is actually organized or stored. It's, it's just the, the, the message that we're sending. And, and for, for each one of these, we're, we want to roughly know wh which events are going to affect each query, but we're not going to expect a one-to-one -one correspondence. I mean, scooping poops will directly affect the sanitation level, but will also affect the average mood and then, in turn, the critter count. Uh, now, earlier we were, we were talking about our app in terms of layers and the, the artifacts associated with them. Uh, I still don't know what to call this middle layer, so I'm just gonna call it the app core. Um, so now let's look at them in terms of the vocabularies they use for the matches that they send. So if this was like a traditional web app, uh, each, each layer you know, has, has, its own, has its own vocabulary. So like the, the UI is the, you know, you're talking to it in DOM terms. The database, you're talking to it in SQL terms. In the app core, you're talking in your app vocabulary. Now, the interesting thing here is that, you know, everybody's got the same DOM, and basically everybody's got the same SQL, but your app vocabulary is a special snowflake. That is for you and you alone. Uh, you know, and so since we've decided that the app core is the foundation, we'll rearrange the graph so that uh, the foundation is, uh, you know, so that the app core is the foundation, the UI and the database are now both on top of their, their peers. Um, we've got a wide enough screen for this, so. Uh, you know, is, now how do the layers communicate when they don't speak the same language? Uh, there's an idea uh, from Alistair Cockburn. Uh, it was called hexagonal architecture, but that actually didn't make any sense, so now they call it ports and adapters. Uh, and the idea is that between these layers, we have uh, the adapters transform messages from one domain to the other. Uh, so, so, like, so for example, this is in, in the DOM adapter, uh, the, this, this is mapping DOM events like clicking to uh, clicking on the critter to an app event, like selecting it. And then going in the, the opposite direction, the adapter uh, you know, provides data, you know, tr transforms data from the, the store uh, into data for the UI. So you can map the, the application state that stores data about the critter into the graphical representation of it. Uh, and then this is the, the data persistence layer. And don't worry, this is, that, this is the, the most actual code you will, you will see in this talk. Um, when, when the app loads, it fetches data from, uh, we'll just say, local storage uh, and dispatches the data loaded message, the whole thing. Uh, and then every five seconds, it auto saves. You know, because now this is basically my, my preferred interface is no interface. Um, and, and note that I, I use local storage in this example, but it, it, it wouldn't make any difference to any other part of the app if we were using IndexedDB or if we were using Pouch or if we were making a call to remote server and it was being persisted in a SQL database. And the same goes for the UI. We could be talking to the DOM directly or going through virtual DOM or we could just be, we could just be work, as easily working over standard I.O. I mean, the, the whole process could be completely local or could be setting off a chain reaction of messages uh, across dozens of servers like one of these uh, executive desk toys. Now, a side note, um, have you, you all have seen this ad on Twitter, right? Uh, you, you have no idea how much anxiety this gives me. <laughs> uh, 
And uh, not only can you swap out one database or, uh, uh, or one UI format for another, and you can also you can also swap in tests. And it turns out it's it's it's, it's actually a lot easier to, to test against a handful of messages than rather than mock a whole database or a whole UI framework. Uh, now now going back to the vocabulary, you know they've got I've got these three categories of, of messages, uh, and we've talked about the user events. They're basically direct, in our case, uh, direct mapping from DOM to app events. Uh, each one of these is each one of these is something that is directly caused by the user. And the date event, this is something that is, you know, it, this happens on page load. Um, but then we've, I've also got these critter events. Um, now, what do I do with these? How do I handle the critter's behavior? Now, uh, the critters react to the actions of the user, but they aren't directly controlled by the user. Um, they act as independent entities. Uh, they, they receive messages about the game world and the user's actions and then advance their inner private state, but they emit behaviors on their, you know, basically on their own schedule. They, they answer to, critters answer to no one. Um, <laughs> and the asynchronous nature of this behavior and the, the encapsulated state suggests that we could manage the critters as their own independent processes. Now, but now, by process, I'm, I mean I'm, I got the name from Unix processes, but I mean I mean an entity with a private state that communicates through message passing. I mean this is also work, described web workers and uh, actors and Erlang, uh, even a lot of you know regular code that upholds these boundaries, like you know a Redux store or something like that. Uh, and if, of course, in a lot of languages, they'd call an entity with private state that communicates through message passing an object. Um, now, if we, now we go back to the graph, the, the database and the UI and the app, the app core, those are, these are all processes or objects or whatever. Um, so let's, uh, let's slide that critter uh, process uh, right in there. So, and now the critters are participants in the system rather than just data. And you know, in a way, the, the critters are users as much as the humans are. Now, I, I keep hammering on about isolation and independence and encapsulation, and like, but like, why do we want to do this? Is, is, is this like a libertarian thing? I mean, it, 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 it's, it, it's definitely a less familiar way of designing software, and it, it seems like it's a lot more complex. Uh, why do we want to go to the trouble of encasing every little thing in a suit of armor? We, we do this because conceptual boundaries enable material boundaries. Uh, boundaries across time or boundaries across space. Uh, independent processes can be made to run on separate cores or on separate continents. Uh, so which, which this brings me to the, the moment uh, you've been waiting for. Oh boy, it's microservices. Uh, now I've been working on this talk for months and uh, frankly I've, I, I, I've, never, I've never been less sure what qualifies something as a microservice. Um, I, 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 I kind of regret putting in the title. Uh, now microservices, it appears to be when you take a big box and turn it into a bunch of little boxes. <laughs> um, also, hexagons seem to be really important. Uh, now, now, most of us, even if we haven't experienced this ourselves, we've at least we've we've at least heard people complain about microservices with the you know that weary fatalism. Mostly, we usually hear when you know people are talking about JavaScript. Uh, you know, it's the worst option except for all others. Uh, now, now this is this is extremely hand wavy, but uh, distributing an already loosely coupled system, it's not, it's not painless, isn't as dire as trying to untangle you know your run of the mill monolithic code. So, so for example, uh, the critter processes will run just fine on the main thread. Um, they'll be fairly straightforward to extract them into a worker if that's necessary or useful. And uh, if the design changes, if, if, our, our, if the goals of this pr program change, or if we want to go to like uh, you know, a, a more uh, multiplayer environment, uh, we, could, uh, we, could, we could have the, all the critters run server side and send the messages over a socket. We could, we could even make this like a, like a massively multi-critter online rodent petting game. <laughs> Now, now another no, another one of the pain points with uh, microservices that uh, is just that, like network ad adding networks to something is is a great way to make things like unreliable. I mean, not not unreliable in the like like I'm unreliable about like cleaning my critter's cage on a timely schedule, but but just unreliable enough that you need to handle failed connections and timeouts. And you know sometimes your code just crashes. <laughs> uh, now now in the code we used to write. <laughs> And, and the code we used to write, we'd handle this with something like a try-catch block, but you know, how are we going to do that when our code is even running on the same machine? 
Now, what we can do is set up a process as a supervisor for a worker process, which, is, which will handle all the crashes and timeouts and various other errors on, are on their behalf. Uh, now, Fred Hebert, the uh, learning some Erlang guy, uh, he explains more about uh, this, this idea of supervisor trees and the unreasonable efficiency, uh, or in the unreasonable efficacy of turning it off and on again uh, in his uh, talk, uh, The Zen of Erlang. Uh, now, and by the way, uh, there, there's an interesting parallel in the Internet of Things world. Uh, now, I used to have a whole section on IoT in this talk, but I, I took it out because it was too upsetting. Um, <laughs> But then I realized uh, this thing, the reset plug, which uh, basically power cycles your router when the Wi-Fi goes out, is a phys physical manifestation of a process supervisor. <laughs> <coughs> All right. Now, I've, I've spent, uh, I think I've spent a, a good amount of time on this project. I, I deserve some you know, compensation. Uh, so I'm thinking about ways to monetize. Uh, I, I want to add some purchasable content, uh, you know, fancier houses, uh, gourmet kibbles, maybe little hats. People like hats. Um, I mean, if I could take the, if this takes off, I could start making the Kim Kardashian bucks. But, uh, you know, in, you know, in-app purchase is surprisingly difficult to get right. Um, I mean, you need to coordinate the client and the server and the payment processor. I mean, one, one, of, the, one of the upsides of being in an app store is they handle this coordination for you. Now, what if we had to do this ourselves? Uh, what we'd want is a, a process that handles coordinating our servers with the payment processor. We, wanna, we want a state machine that tracks each step of the procedure. Uh, you know, you want to process the request, uh, charge the credit card, and update the data, and then revert any of the changes if, if, in, if any phase of that breaks. Uh, this turns out to be an implementation of something called the Saga pattern. Uh, sagas fulfill, in a lot of ways, the same purpose as a database transaction in situations where locking would be impossible, like if you're, you know, in, you're dealing with like, other people's APIs, or impractical, just because it's like it would take too long. Um, more depth on this, because uh, I spent about 30 seconds describing it, you might want to watch Katie McCaffrey's talk, Applying the Saga Pattern. Uh, now, now, even the app core can be split across multiple processes. Uh, now, for, for some background there, the, the traditional event model, uh, you have a listener for every event that changes app state independently. Uh, this, is, this is, you know, a little, a little messy. Hard to test, hard to reason about. Uh, this is a pictured uh, race conditions. Um, <laughs> now, the, the, the approach that the, I, I, was in, I was introduced with in Redux was that you have the single event listener handling every event synchronously. Uh, it's a lot simpler to, easy, simpler to deal with, uh, and it enables some crazy tricks like you know, the time travel debugger. But you know, it, it, for me, it, it's, its greatest accomplishment was encouraging the creation of the app vocabulary, which is you know, the whole first half of this talk. Um, but th there's a parallel to this in the distributed systems world called event sourcing. Uh, the TLDR for that is that the, the cano canonical representation of your app's data, it, 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 it's not what's in the database, it's, it's the log of messages that you received. Everything else can be derived from that. Uh, and that means you can have a cluster of processes handle, it, handle your incoming messages and write them to this log, and then your queries in turn can be spread against muscle, multiple processes that subscribe to this log. Uh, now, Martin Kleppman's turning the database inside out for uh, you know, a slightly more fleshed out version of this, and uh, ask your doctor if eventual consistency is right for you. <sighs> Oof. <coughs> Oof, boy. Yeah, all right, yeah, I crammed a lot in there. Um, I, I feel like we just went through one of those uh, 50 short films about like, oh, gee whiz, I didn't realize springs were so important, <laughs> except, you know, about message passing. Um, now, now, JavaScript has been going through an interesting cultural shift in the, the last, uh, uh, I guess, three or so years. Uh, now, we've never had a particularly strong object-oriented culture. I mean, you just don't see talks about design patterns or solid principles at JavaScript conferences. I'm, I'm sorry if there actually is a talk about solid principles at JavaScript at this conference, but uh, you know, you'll see. I'm, I'm on your side, you'll see. Um, now, we're beginning more and more interested in functional programming. I mean, first there was uh, underscore, um, you know, then you know, underscore is doing it wrong, uh, and then things really took off with React. Uh, and now there's a bunch of JavaScript developers, I mean, still a small minority, but a hell of a loud one, getting really interested in immutability and referential transparency and monads and compile the JS languages <laughs> like ClojureScript and Elm bring this to the browser, uh, they, granting us uh, humble JavaScripters a glimpse into the future. Um, but along with this comes dogma. Uh, I mean, of course, there's the usual suspects with the my paradigm can beat up your paradigm. I mean, uh, what can I say? Redditor is going to Reddit. But, uh, but we, we also have like seemingly respectable members of our community saying that, oh, using classes might cause your company to crash and burn. 
Um, but it, JavaScript is fundamentally incompatible with ideological purity. I mean, it's, it's it, it, if, if, <laughs> If, if you want to go full on year zero, you, there've never been more options to choose from, but JavaScript is necessarily a big tent language that has to solve needs beyond your own. You know, when I picked this image, I was thinking big tent, circus was also appropriate. Uh, uh, but you know, also JavaScript you know, has to continue, to continue to solve the needs of people going back to 1995, and, you know, so, we, so we don't break the web. But, in, but you know, as far as object-oriented programming goes, there, there's a lot of useful wisdom in the last 40 years of study. I mean, look at the, the, note the date on that right screenshot is October 12th, 1977. Uh, we should think about how we can synthesize that with our newfound love of functional programming. Now, this is my big awakening. Uh, well, it's it sunk in with Redux, uh, that it stores internals, uh, the, the, the reducers are pure functions, no side effects and no mutations. But its, it, but its interface is completely the opposite. Dispatch and subscribe are all about side effects, and specifically about message passing. And, and we see the same pattern in, in its big influences, Erlang and Elm. I mean, they're, they're, they're functional languages, but like every, everything interesting they do is in terms of message passing. It's like the programs are nodes and networks of nodes, which, and we have these functional cores and imperative shells, uh, which is something I lifted from a Gary Bernhardt talk from uh, 2012. Uh, which uh, I guess took four years to sink in, but uh, here we are now. Um, so instead of thinking about uh, object-oriented programming in terms of classes and objects, maybe we should think of it as little servers talking to each other. Uh, you know, processes, microservices, actors, workers, guinea pigs, little servers sending messages to each other. Uh, the, the patterns for vast distributed systems can be, can be adapted for a client-side app running across workers. And uh, the Internet of Things is, in many ways, just object orientation made horrifyingly literal. Uh, now, now, JavaScript's defining characteristic, whether for good or for ill, is that it is always accumulating and never moving. But this is, kind of, this is, this is, this is how society works, right? Uh, you know, you, you can't roll back the clock. Uh, you hope to God you don't have to start from scratch. You just, you just keep moving forward. Um, and, and just as event sourcing is, you know, where current state is a left fold of our previous behaviors, uh, society is a left fold of our ideas. And, and dogma is, is, is toxic to society. Uh, we should be, be seeking out new ideas, but we also need to synthesize and compromise those ideas into our prior knowledge because, you know, you never know when a new idea will uncover the hidden wisdom of those before it. Thank you. Thank you.